Hey guys, so we're back and we have another very interesting talk for you. We're going to be welcoming Paul Zitzman from Synthesis. And without further ado, Paul. Hi. How's it? How are you doing? You. Good and you. Good. <laughs> Good. So uh, if you could please give us a little more info about you, that would be nice. Sure. Sure. So I am. Um... As mentioned, I work for Synthesis. I'm a technical lead for the Cape Town region. <clears throat> My background is a bit mixed. I've worked as an actuarial assistant. I'm a qualified engineer, electronic engineer. Um, back in the day when the stack was a bit smaller, I was a full stack developer. I don't think I don't think I can call myself one anymore. And today, I um, I do a lot of work in AWS, um, from enablement to to like this talk is about more on the data realm. So that's what, what my day-to-day -day looks like now. Okay, awesome. Well, you ready to start your presentation? Shall I yeah. leave the floor for you? Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you. Cool, cool. So <clears throat> today I want to I want to talk to you guys about a interesting project we had. Um, and the, like the title um, suggests, it's, uh, it didn't start out as a data lake and uh, maybe didn't even, even end it up like a data lake. Um, and at, at a high level, I want to talk through the architecture and how simple you could do these things. And then some of the learnings, um, some of them specific to the tech stack we chose, to data projects, and some more to like just general good, um, good software development practices. Um, so my intro, we went through this. Um, Please feel free to reach out on social media or GitHub or wherever. Uh, my handle everywhere is PH Sitzman. Um, yeah, and like I mentioned, I'm a I'm a bit of a jack of all trades. So how did this project come to be? So we had a client who, who came to us who said they had they had a lot of data sources, and uh, they they could only utilize a handful of them. Um, because of like resource constraints, and these resource constraints were both on a from a technical point of view, but also from a human resources point of view. Uh, the like the, the data warehouse was a choke point for them; it couldn't handle what they were throwing at it, and the people weren't skilled up in like the latest technology, so they couldn't really do something about that. So, and then on the other side, they had um, data sources that were a bit questionable. Like, um, so there was a there was quite a bit of validation that needed to happen on them. And these, like on these shaky foundations, they were building quite business critical reports. So, so it was quite important to them that they, um, yeah, that that we we sort this out. And and to make matters worse, it was um, it was all manual. So they had to do all these things manual, and and at best they could generate monthly reports where um, where the ask was could we maybe go to a point where we could get reports in real time if possible if it if it made sense. So that was the ask, and immediately after the ask we realized that uh, this is not actually a big data problem. Um, our client just has like they've got a big problem with data, and and that was what we're actually going to solve for them. Um, so getting started, like uh, the first phase of the project, um, we said, okay, cool. what do we have to our, like, what, what do we have in our tool belt? And the client was, a, um, they've been running on AWS for a, for a long while. They had a very mature um, AWS estate and cloud capabilities internal. Um, the specific team you're working with, not so much, but as, a, as an organization, they had really good AWS skills. So that was a that was an obvious choice for us. And then the team was made up out of data analysts and very traditional um, data people. Uh, no heavy data engineering skills, though, no software development skills. Um, so, so out of that, we immediately realized that we would have to build something, unless we were planning on maintaining this forever, which is not something we really want to do. We had to build something that's quite low maintenance. So that was something that we had to keep in the back of our heads. Um, and also we we had to solve like one business unit's problems. And 
uh, it was like it's easier to get tempted to build something that serves like um, the entire organization's needs um, but but and forgetting about this like just like you actually have to first solve one one person's problem so that was also something we were focusing on to say okay cool to get started these are the things so we started with a very very simple architecture and you can you can google um, data like architectures and you get something like this and um, and this is a very good starting point in fact we we had to remove some of the, the services that you usually have in this. Um, so something like AWS step functions, we couldn't use that because the um, in many of the big organizations, services, cloud services need to be approved and go through quite a stringent security check and um, guardrails need to be put around them. And, and that had a, at that point hasn't happened for, for step functions. So we couldn't do that. Um, so st we couldn't use step functions. So for orchestration, we had to get creative. Um, we also didn't want to include something like uh, Apache Airflow, even though it's a very good piece of software. Um, it was a, it would be something that the client would have to maintain, which was not what we wanted. So we went all serverless. Um, S3 buckets, obviously serverless. Glue was a relatively new service when we started the project. And um, we used Glue jobs for our ETLs. And we used Glue crawlers to populate the Glue data catalog, um, which could then be queried by things like Athena, QuickSight, um, and you could even uh, actually we did we, we used um, a JDBC plugin that allowed you to query data through Athena um, in in Power BI. So we could even do dashboarding in Power BI with this very simple architecture. So at its core, Glue uses um, Spark. Oh, actually you have two modes. You can run it in, in Spark with just vanilla Python. We used Spark when we started. And we there's an abstraction over it in, in Glue. Um, we decided to not use that. We wanted to keep our ETLs as close to, to Spark like a vanilla spark as we can, because we didn't at that stage have confidence in in glue that that it would be the like the final solution. So we didn't want to build too much on this abstraction, glue abstraction that you might not have in something like EMR if or if you wanted to run these glue jobs somewhere else. So we just ran vanilla spark. And glue gave us some interesting bookmarking capabilities. Um, we didn't really use it, but but that was something that uh, another tool we had. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the the glue crawlers and the catalog um, like worked well with a lot of other AWS services. So that was that was pretty cool. So this was our initial architecture that we came up with. And being devs, um, we said like there's only one way to do this. We have to do it um, infrastructure as code. So even though we were trying to get to a point where we were proving value quickly for the client, this was uh, like uh, something we, we didn't compromise on. Everything had to be infrastructure as code. And we are big fans of Terraform and um, we wrote, we built everything in Terraform. So that entire, that entire architecture, uh, this would be a single pipeline. We would code out a pipeline and you could spin up as many of these as you needed. Um, so, for us, that was like that. That was that was early on a very good choice we made. And infrastructure as code is, um, even though it's like it's not like a proper coding language, um, it's still code, and there can still be bugs in it. And we followed like proper software development practices with this, where you had pull requests, you code, you had code reviews, a code was versioned. Um, so we we treated it like like you would with application code. So this was the first phase of the project. And after this phase, um, and this was about maybe six weeks, um, what we had is we had uh, disposable pipelines. And what I mean with disposable is they were very easy to spin up and we could spin up as many as we want, as quick as we want, and we can kill them again uh, without, like we weren't very attached to them. Our pipelines did not actually include the storage layer. So the S3, it didn't provision S3 buckets. It would just reference existing buckets. And, and that was part of like the, the setup at that enterprise. We weren't 
we couldn't spin up our own buckets. Um, so a, a, a central team did that for us. So these, like you could you could kill these pipelines or, or, or like spin them up as you wanted, which is really, really cool because it gave us a good foundation to build on going forward. At that point, we did a historic update of quite a lot of data. And, um, and these manual extracts, we started feeding that in um, into the into the data into the data lake and then what what was cool in this relatively short period we got most of the data sources they were using in their current setup in queryable formats so you could go into athena and quicksight and build dashboards and we did exactly that we built very like it was very ba basic at that point but we built dashboards that could be um basically operationalized so in a, in a short span that is, that was the output, and in that short short time span, we started showing value to the business owners. Um, being like being new services, and and we be we were quite new to to Glue as well. Um, there were some learnings in this. It it wasn't just smooth sailing. So the first thing we didn't realize was. Um, we thought glue jobs would function more like lambdas, like you invoke it, it runs, it gives you something back. Um, it was not the case. Glue jobs do not run like that. You submit the job, it goes into a queue, and you wait for it to come back, um, or you, you you actually pull that job to get the to get um, when it's finished. It doesn't actually return anything. So it's outputs the stuff that the ETL outputs that that's the outputs. It doesn't return anything to you. And, and that was something we had to to um, keep in mind. Also, um, you're quite reliant on the availability of of uh, jobs. So you submit a job with a certain size and um, for the glue job and, and AWS needs that like provisions that capacity. And sometimes you sit in a queue and you wait for a job. So that could sometimes take 10 minutes before your job actually starts. Um, that has been improved significantly um, recently. But that, that was a real thing for us. So our frequency in which we could run jobs was um, was not as quick as we initially thought we could. Um, so <clears throat> next thing was glue crawlers. We had a dream where we could point a, a crawler to a raw data set and it would go and discover the schema for us. And we can just manipulate that schema and, and spit it out on the other side and crawl it again. It didn't work like that. Um, the glue crawlers are, are it's, it's actually not a limitation on the glue craw crawler, it's just the way that the underlying technologies work. Um, you could get varying results depending on what type of data you point your crawler to. So if you had a CSV file and you've got a column that only has numbers in um, today, but it's actually a, a, a string field and that data set just particularly like only had numbers in, it would classify it as a number column. Tomorrow, that column might contain a string value, and suddenly the column type will change, which is not a good thing. Um, so the crawlers had to, like, we had to use them with with caution. Um, but that's something you, you we, we figured out quite early, so that was not not a, a train smash. Um, the next thing is like we used Bokeh as our output format. Um, it's a it's quite a hard format to work with, um, just in general. Like if you have a Bokeh file, you want to read it. It's not like opening a JSON file and reading it, but there's so many benefits with using it. Um, it plays well with a lot of tools in the big data space. Um, it's it's a, it's a bit of a standard, which is good. And the way we stored our files in Parquet also meant that we could, we, we compressed them, which made our queries a lot faster because there's like just less content to pull up from S3. Um, and then our orchestration was not ideal. Um, like I mentioned, we couldn't um, we couldn't use step functions. We didn't have airflow, so we kind of um, hooked these events together using CloudWatch events and lambdas, um, and it made it quite tricky to if a file dropped in your raw location and it had to go through some ETLs um, and then end up in a in a final destination, like. If you didn't know the system quite well, it it was it was tricky to figure out, um, like where in the process is your file. 
But that was the first phase and it was very successful. So the next phase we said, okay, cool. Um, we were still ingesting manual data sources. Like people were still going to SQL servers, extracting data, um, CSVs being dropped in, all kinds of weird and wonderful file, for, um, file formats. Um, and that was still a bottleneck. So we still like couldn't get the throughput we wanted. Like we couldn't generate reports fast enough because we were reliant on people to do that. So a second phase was let's focus on automation. Let's get um, as many sources as we can um, automatically. And, and and that would like that was for us the logical the logical next step. So we looked at our architecture and we said, well, <clears throat> We don't like our orchestration, but it's working. Um, so let's use this block, this this pipeline we have that is, we can just use it as is. We can spin up as many, many as we want. And that could become the core of, of our, for each data source, the pipeline, pipeline that goes with it. Um, so we had to solve this like automation problem. Like what robot are we going to plug in there to, to fix our automation? And it wasn't an obvious choice either because we initially we only had mo oh, most of our data sources were only coming from SQL sources like SQL databases. Um, but we quickly realized these like there's all kinds of weird and wonderful um, data sources out there that we, we would like to consume that would be very valuable to do the project. Um, and the most notable um, exception would be SAS services where we had to poke an API to get data back. We couldn't just get some big dump, file dump, or, or um, subscribe to an event and get the stuff in real time. We actually had to call REST APIs to get that. So for this ingestion automation options, we looked at, at like a plethora of services. Um, file gateway was something we looked at, but it wasn't really a a option because our SQL sources would have um, our SQL sources would do would have to do something like a, a BCP extract, drop it in a network drive, which would have to uh, go through or via file transfer or file gateway into AWS. So and and that would also involve quite a bit of work from from other teams, teams that we don't have control over. So it's like it's cool, um, but probably not the best choice. Then we looked at things like EMR and um, EC2 batch to, to run these extracts. And they're awesome services, but we also decided that um, there's EC2s involved, there's servers. We don't want to manage servers. So, so let's, um, let's not go there for now. Um, DMS was something we really wanted to do, the data migration services. I don't, if, if you're not familiar with it, uh, you can you can use DMS to get a one-time extract from a database, or you can use DMS to to continuously um, ex like get changes, like CDC um, change data, yeah, um, yeah, to get that change data from from the um, from your from your source. And uh, unfortunately, again, being an enterprise um, that has to go through their due diligence with the service, uh, DMS was not available. To us, so we couldn't we couldn't use DMS, even though it's like a really good way to get data from from SQL servers. It would also just solve for SQL. Um, and then there's like the the Swiss Army knife of AWS, which is the um, Lambdas. And like I mentioned earlier, we didn't really have like big data. It was just a lot of like sources and um, and they were all over the place. So so we decided to give Lambda a go. Let's see if we can we can use Lambdas to connect to those databases, extract um, extract the data, uh, chuck it into the S3 buckets, and and go from there. So so Lambda was was what we ended up with. We later realized we could have used Glue Glue jobs. So a Glue job doesn't run within the VPC context. So from a networking point of view, if you wanted to get from your VPC and AWS to a network on-prem, um, if it doesn't run within a VPC context, like that wouldn't work. But Clue has a thing called connections, which is meant to hook you in with, like you put in a, a connection string, a SQL connection string, and your Glue job would, ha would have connectivity to that. What we realized is like 
it provisions a network interface in your VPC for that job, which puts that job onto the network. Even if that connection string is not valid, um, it doesn't matter, you don't have to actually use it, um, but we could have done that. So we could have used our jobs to directly hook into the sources and um, get the data. So that was something we realized a bit later. So if you ever wanted to get your glue jobs onto a VPC, um, that's a really good way to do it. So we had our black box, which was provisioning um, pipelines, and now we had lambdas doing all like all kinds of weird and wonderful stuff to to get data from APIs, um, from SQL sources. We had to we had to create lambda layers to do Kerberos authentication. So it sounds a bit wacky, but we actually had lambdas do um, with a, with lambda layers that could do Kerberos authentication, and it worked. Um, lambdas are, are extremely powerful. And what this allowed us to do is we could onboard a lot of data. And we did, <laughs> we went crazy. Like if there was a data source that someone remotely was interested in, we would onboard it. And this is where our first big lesson happened. Schemas, like DBAs would change schemas and our ETLs would just burn. And, uh, and we realized like the schema changes thing, schema changes is a real thing. Um, and they change in all kinds of ways, like columns get added, columns get removed, um, data types change, and columns just get renamed. And um, this is something we, lit we didn't think of at all. Um, and this was never a problem for the team because they would go and extract the data in like their manual extract and they would massage the data into whatever they needed for their report. So they were kind of like, for them, schema changes was like, even though they had experienced it, it was not something that was top of mind for them because it was just like business as usual. And and for us coming in from the outside, um, we missed something here and, and this was quite bad because um, now a schema would change and it would completely break your pipeline. Your ETL would not work. Um, in some cases it would work, but the output is not the same from the previous day. It was a nightmare. Um, so, so to give an example of how how things started like started breaking and how things started getting weird, um, like in this example, a column getting added. So there was only these few columns, and this is an example I generated. Um, and then on the next on the next um, data set, there would be a name like. A string, a string column being added. And Clue is clever. It figures, I like the, the crawler figures out, ah, oh, awesome, there's a new column, and it can totally handle that. So if you query that data set um, across all records, it would realize like, okay, cool, maybe a, a logical value for a string field that wasn't there yesterday, but it's there today, is just an empty string. So you can see it, it would just populate it for all the records with empty strings and that was kind of okay we could handle that but it would make these type of assumptions on on other data sets or other data types as well which didn't always have such a friendly outcome um, the bigger problem was when data types changed or when column headers changed like the column name changed you would get something like this where this was a uh, a double, the data type was a, a double, and the next time it's uh, it turns into a string for whatever reason. And this was a massive breaking change. And this puts, it's not only your ETL that breaks, um, and in fact, your ETL usually didn't break on this, it's downstream systems that started breaking. Um, you would get something like this where you would want to query the data, same query as the previous time, um, but now these, these conflicting data types and um, the underlying technology being Hive, like it's a schema mismatch. It cannot handle that. There is simply no way of handling it. You could totally go and you can query up until a certain date where all the schemas look the same. And then after the date where it changed and all the schemas look the same, and, and that would be fine. But if we query across those changes, then things got, got weird. 
and it, like, this was not a, a fun way of for things to break um, and we didn't actually expect this to happen um, so so what we like we had to scramble and, and we, we really um, we weren't sure how to handle this so what we came up with doing after doing a bit of research is to say like, today we partition our data so if you're not familiar with with partitioning in this context is um, within S3 it looks like a folder uh, but what, when you write these parquet files and you use partitioning, um, depending on the columns you're using to partition, Park, um, Spark will write those files under the correct partitions. And what makes this really powerful is if you use these partitions, so they are seen as virtual um, virtual columns in your data set. If you query on them, um, queries can be optimized massively. Like an, if, if you queried something that sits on 2020, month one, day one, it would, um, even if you do a select star, it, would, it wouldn't go across like your entire data source. It would only query that folder. Uh, I say folder there, uh, but, but you get the idea. It, it would only pull up those files, making it queries much faster, much cheaper. Um, so this is like, this was our first approach um, where we partitioned on date. And then we realized that um, these schemas, let's let's try and version these schemas. Let's see if we could say um, schemas look a certain way at a certain, um, yeah, they look a certain way. So let's save, um, let's version it. Like that's the version of the schema and we store it under that. And then all our downstream um, queries and systems would know like I can totally consume version one of a schema and we our responsibility was then just to ensure that um, that we don't break that version so that the schema that there's no schema changes for version one no additions no removals no changes nothing there's, if the schema changes in any way we would have to create a version two um, but what that allowed us to do is to say we could run multiple um, versions of an, like a, we versioned our ETL, so the ETL kind of was tied to a schema. Um, we could run multiple ETLs, multiple versions, they write to the same bucket, but under a different partition. And depending on the schema change, they could run in parallel. Like if it's a, if it's a non-breaking schema change, because you've got schema changes that's not like, uh, classified as a non-breaking schema change, um, we could run them in parallel. Or, or if it's a breaking schema change, um, for example, a, a mandatory field. So some of our data sets had hundreds of columns of which we weren't interested in all hundred. Um, there was ones that we know are mandatory and we we had to write a little library to where we could have a schema definition and say, um, these are mandatory, these are not. If it's not, they're treated, like, treated in this way, like either put in a default or alert us or whatever. Um, so if it's not a breaking change, we could run them in parallel. If it's a breaking change, we could just like, like not, not we could, we had to decide how do we treat this. So we would write, for example, version two could have been a breaking change. We would write a version three that could handle it. And then we had to go to the, the business users, the guys consuming our data to say like this change happened. It's a breaking change. How do you want us to handle it? Do you want us to go back to the version two schema and do it, do a migration to version three? Like take that data, move it. Or are you comfortable querying across two versions? Because you could do that as well. But that, that gave us like, a, like it, that would buy us some time to handle this and our system wouldn't go down when things like this happen. So that little library we wrote, like, even though it was pretty simple and, and our schema definitions was pretty simple at that stage um, or how we handled schema evolution was was pretty simple. It, it really saved us. Um, so at this, after this phase of the project, we were ingesting a lot of data and we, we were automating it. Um, we were doing, um, we had a little library that could handle our our definition of schema evolution and we had versioning and um, things were flying. We were generating reports like very frequently. 
not daily at that stage, but but um, uh, not on a monthly basis. Um, our ETLs were doing quite good, like it's very fundamental, but but still better than nothing. Um, uh, data quality checks, and we were doing data cleaning, and we were normalizing data um, column heads, headers. So if there was something like a name column, um, some data sources would have it like first name, others would call it capital N, others would just have under like lower cases. We would normalize all that stuff so that you could write, like your queries became much more legible, legible as well, um, because we were doing this normalization across data sources. Um, and doing some very basic data quality checks and some cleanups in our ETLs. So from this phase, what we learned is that like, you cannot rely on, on these tools um, and it's not loose specific um, to, to handle your schema evolution for you and to um, it'll, like it'll just work. That That is not how things work. We like you have to um, like a, from day one, you have to assume that your data will change and or your, your schemas will change and you need a way to handle that. Um, we've, after this project, we've implemented similar architectures at, at more than one client and um, schema versioning is like, like continue, like it, like continues to come up. Like we're saying, uh, this is the way we, we're using it and, and it's proven valuable. Um, and it's definitely something that I would recommend if you do a project like this to like, that's a good first pass. You might come up with a much better strategy later on, but as a, as a, to, to get something out there that is, is quite robust, um, schema versioning is definitely the way to go. Um, and then data partitioning, like, and versioning ties into this is like use partitioning. As we started onboarding sources, a lot more sources, we, re we realized that partitioning is actually saving us a lot of money. Um, our queries would become like slow and expect like slow is expensive. So that's the same thing. So um, by by partitioning our data correctly, um, like we, we actually saved quite a bit of money. And then serverless is just is like serverless is the best. In this entire project, um, up to this point, we had little to no maintenance. Um, our lambdas, we had to maintain our code. Like you always have to maintain your code that you can't get rid of that. Um, but we didn't have to worry about um, like, do we patch the server? Um, are we running out of storage? Like none of that, we had none of those problems. We could 100% focus on the business problem, what we're trying to solve for the client. And we could like, sure, you have to size your lambdas and you have to monitor that your lambdas are not running out of um, like running too long or running out of memory, uh, but you do, any case have to do that no matter what you do. So, um, and the same applies to your jobs. You have to monitor your glue jobs to see if you've got enough um, processing units for them. Um, but that, 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 that's really simple to do. Um, so, so serverless was the reason we could focus on the business problem and not on the IT problem. Um, so if we look back at that point at the project, like what did we build? And I would say we like we kind of built like a data something, um, and then we joke we say like if it if it quacks like a data lake, um, and then well it is not really a data lake. Um, AWS has their own definition of a data lake. Um, James Dixon had his own definition of what a data lake could be, but if you look at this, um, it's a centralized thing. It uh, all that that's what you expect of a data lake. It's a centralized thing, and that's the first rule we broke. We didn't. We were a silo. We looked at a single business unit, even though we were centralizing data. Um, we were pulling it in from multiple sources from different business units. It was for our business units. We weren't centralizing it for consumption as well. Even though over time more people started consuming it, that was not its main purpose. There was a specific business unit this was built for. Then another thing they'll they'll tell you in data lake school is that you can check in structured and unstructured data. I mean, you can go wild at any scale. Um, we found that that didn't really hold. Um, and maybe maybe we were wrong. Um, I haven't seen a data lake where you just chuck stuff in without it becoming a swamp. Um, so we felt quite strong that you have to like 
you have to actually process the data a bit. Um, and that, that, like that can vary. We did quite a lot of processing because it was for our business use case. So we did, like we completely broke the mold there, the, the using data as is. Um, we didn't do that. We like sure we consumed it from the source as is. And if we found like bad, like nasties in the data, we would feed back to the, to the team, the source system team and tell them, like, dude, there's something funky in your data. Um, please have a look. We wouldn't just continue cleaning that stuff up without feeding it back. But um, we didn't use the data just as is. We manipulated the data quite a bit um, to get the value out of it that we needed. And we have, we did that like in the data lake. It wasn't an, it, a layer um, after the data lake were there that happened. Um, so that's not really going with the data lake um, mantra. And then in AWS's definition, um, you can use it in real time analytics as well, which I don't like, I don't fully agree. Data lakes are slow moving things um, compared to real time, something like Kafka or Kinesis. Um, that's not what they were built for. They do not. Um, they do not do that well. And if you look at the tooling around them, um, like Spark is a great tool, but it's not built for real time. Um, it's like it's batch driven, even though it's like it can go micro batch. It is still batchy. It's not real time. So I don't actually think we built a data lake, but it does. It does have some um, like here and there. It does crack like a like a data lake. So what the system looks like today is like they're consuming um, more than 50 data sources coming in. And like I said, all weird and wonderful types of data. Dashboards are being updated on a daily basis. Um, and that was due to many things. Automation was, was just one part of it. Um, the data cleaning steps we were taking and um, yeah, yeah, the, like actually the data cleaning was a big thing and, and doing integrity checks on the data um, was key to to getting to getting this in because a, a lot of the, the work they usually had to do is like manual data cleanup and manual data checks to see if, if things are going good. Um, so so that was key for us. Um, this thing ended up serving more more business units than we planned. Um, so we had our core business unit who was funding the project, but other data data or oh, business units, not data units, sorry, business units were pulling from um, from our um, from our lake, and um, but they weren't um, they weren't pushing the the direction of which we were taking this thing. They were just consuming that they were consuming the data as is. So whatever we needed to do to the data, they consumed that data um, from us, which was a kind of an unexpected thing to happen. Um, and we built repeatable patterns. So the way we structured our code was we had um, our infra infrastructure as code, but also these repeatable building blocks. So if as an organization, if someone had to spin up a, a data pipeline that could take data in on S3 um, or, or data that gets dumped in S3, no matter how it gets there, and it needs to be processed and end up in another S3 bucket and the ETL jobs had to be orchestrated and they had to be monitored and alerting had to be had to happen on them. You could just use our modules, our Terraform modules, and just implement them and it would work. Um, our data ingestion lambdas, they were also Terraform modules that you can consume. So if you like the, the Kerberos problem we solved, it's a really hard problem um, with Lambda, but it's done and, and you could it, it was repeatable. So there was value um, beyond the business. We kind of democratized the ability to build data lakes, um, even though it's not really a data lake, and then very little maintenance. Like this thing was completely, completely serverless, um, which was great. Like that is, um, we could as a coming in as a as a as a, a vendor or a consultant, I can I can leave the project feeling like warm and fuzzy that the client can actually run with this thing. Um, and we skilled up the the on-prem team or the, the client team to be able to run with this thing going forward. They can build it out. Um, sure, they're not SMEs in in cloud, and they're not developers. So there will be a point where they they'll run out of steam. But for the most part, they've got something that they can run and maintain, um, which which makes me happy. I, I think that's it was a quite a responsible thing to do. So the future of the project is. 
looking now at how do we actually get streaming data in and how do we incorporate streaming data sources or fast changing data, because um, in our case, all the data sources were slow moving um, data sources. Uh, how do we bring this in with this, like, um, how do we incorporate this with this slow moving data lake? So how do we bring these two things together? How do we marry, marry them? Um, like, uh, and how do we leverage off the pros and like all the pros that, that the two different architectures have? So that's what we're doing today. Um, quite exciting stuff. And then data quality is like a constant thing. Like, how do we improve data quality? How do we improve our tests, our like our data integrity tests? So that's a that's a, a ongoing thing on the project. And and uh, bring in more sources, um, so give us more. So yeah. So looking back at the project, um, some of the like the good things, the bad things, and, and and some of the awesome things we discovered, um, and some takeaways. And as I mentioned, it's not just for data projects this is for software some software development things in general um, so for me very important follow the money someone is paying for that project if you're the internal team delivering on it or if you're a consultant um, someone is putting money on the table to get this thing done um, prove value to them quickly um, give them their money's worth very quickly in the project um, focus on on that because um, that will buy your product sponsor or your business sponsor, buy them some breathing room, it buys you some time to do cool stuff. Um, so, and, and it's a win-win. You get to you get those um, learnings that you only get once, like once something is being consumed in the real world. Like you can dev and test for days. Um, you'll only you'll only figure out like the real the real shortcomings when people start using the thing. So get people to use your, your product as quickly as possible. And in our case, it was this, this data lake. Um, there is a flip side to this though. It's not just um, all smiles when you, when you deliver um, business value quickly. It means you've got something in production early in your project. And production systems needs maintenance and you get production support tickets. So that's the flip side. Um, of getting into production quickly, but I, I totally think it's um, it's worth it. Uh, you, you, actually, I, I don't think you can deliver a successful project if you don't do if you don't um, follow the money. Then for techies, um, this is one for us. This is like get over yourself. Um, like we like new tech. We want to do stuff complicated. Um, incorporate the latest and greatest. Like, keep it simple. Um, focus on the business problem, not the IT problem. Don't make don't make this business problem an IT problem. We tend to do that. Um, so in our case, we were obsessed with automation. Like everything had to be automated. Like our data came in, and and um, just the entire process had to be automated. And we realized like there's already a manual process to get data, to to collect data. It was a crap process but it was a process um, and we leveraged off that existing process to get our pipelines fleshed out. And then once that was done, that was the first phase, we could focus on the automation. Um, so that was for us something we had to do. And then like operational excellence, um, you can build the best technical thing ever. If no one can run the thing and keep it up and running, it's useless. So for us, Going serverless was a big part of that, but also putting processes in place of how do you get data into this thing? If, if there's, a, if there's a, a need for a new data source, what's the process of onboarding a new data source? What's the process of validating that this data is correct, that our ETLs are working, um, and that, that like the changes we're making to the data is valid? Like those, those processes were put in place quite early, which was, which was um, like you reap the rewards. Um, further down the line and then like this doesn't fit in here but I didn't actually know where to put it in is like your stateful your stateful pieces of your of your project um, try and get them solid um, it's very easy in, in this project's um, con project context to change the pipelines you could do that very easily without without any like major repercussions we could completely rip out our architecture and check something um, managed in there and it would work um, because we weren't touching our we weren't touching s3 where our data lived like 
get your ETLs solid. Um, if you produce really bad data, um, that's like you're pushing that stuff. It's being stored and changing that afterwards is a pain. Um, so, so get those things um, solid early on or we'll focus on that. And it's like kind of data quality stuff. Um, this one is, uh, again, techies. Um, we love new toys, but we need to bring a client and we need to bring an entire team with you. Like these new things are scary. Um, at some point you want a departure from your client um, or from that team you're working in. If you're an internal team, you, do, you don't want to be the guy or the girl maintaining the data lake for the rest of your career. Um, bring people with you on the journey. Um, skill people up around you. That will only make your load um, lighter. And in that process, while you're teaching them a new, a new skill, like a new tool, um, a lot of times they are domain experts in their own right in something that you're not. So you're picking up from them as well. And, and like it, it's mutually beneficial. So definitely uh, bring people along with the ride. Like it's, it's awesome. Um, get everyone excited about what you're doing. Then back to the data, like we partitioned on date, um, but sometimes it's not that obvious on what you, on what you'll have to partition your data, um, and that's okay. Like you're going to make mistakes. Repartitioning in this world is is not hard. Um, Spark can can do that with a with a pretty simple ETL script. Um, you could you could repartition your data, and it's not an expensive exercise either. Um, it's a time-consuming one, um, or it can be time-consuming if you get to a point where you've got petabytes, um, and that that uh, that is expensive. Then, but um, early on, don't don't go into analysis paralysis to figure out like, oh, what is the correct partitioning? Like you can figure that out later. Um, on some of our data sources, we had very obvious. Um, obvious columns that we wanted to partition on and others we didn't have that obvious um, it wasn't that obvious and we had to change that and that's fine um, and it wasn't the same for every data source either so don't don't get too fast with with um, with your partitioning um, just to like use like use all use all the information you have at that point make it like the best choice at that point and then if you need to change it change it later on um, and this, like, as I mentioned, schemas change, like that's going to happen guaranteed, no matter how, how big or small it is. Um, it is like, you'll, you'll have to deal with it. Um, another thing is you're going to have encoding problems in your data sets. That's just how things are. So make sure that you, that you can handle it. Um, I'm going to run, I see I'm running out of time. I'm going to run through these few, next few. Like lambdas are immensely powerful. Don't underestimate them from AWS point of view. Um, lambda layers are are really cool. And recently they see, they introduced EFS for lambda, um, so you can attach storage to them, um, and they run for 15 minutes. I mean, 15 minutes is a long time. Like you can do a lot of stuff um, in them. So so use them. Like use them to a point where they don't make sense anymore, um, and then look for something else. Then with glue specifically, what's your spend? Like you can run, a, spend can run away very, very quickly. Um, the default settings on like jobs are quite crazy. Um, that might have changed, uh, but but when we started, it was something like you had ten DPUs. We only needed two, like a minimum of two. Um, your job timeout was forty eight hours, and and you're paying for forty US cents. Um, Per DPU per hour. So if you multiply that out, that that's a that's quite an amount that you could have a job that's hanging or something weird happens. Um, also, there's retries. Be careful for retries. Like know your ETL, like know your job, and know what a retry is going to cause. Like if you're doing bookmarking, maybe retries could help you, but like use it with caution because you could end up racking up quite a serious bill. Um, when we worked on it, you paid for ten minutes minimum. Um, it's now down to a minute, and um, that that's that's awesome. So that that's a big thing. And then monitor, keep make sure that that you're you're fully utilizing 
um, all the DPUs you have and if you're running out of space. And then the last one, very, very important when you're on a data project, like your ETLs and your S3 storage and your pipelines and all that stuff, that's not your product. The data is your product. Um, treat it like a product. Make sure it's reliable, um, that the people consuming it, um, th that it's a trusted source for them. Make sure it's re reproducible um, so th that people can verify, like, how did you get from raw to, to processed and then um, do it in a repeatable fashion for us at this infrastructure is good. So, yeah. and that's it. That's it for me. Um, if you're interested in joining the synthesis team, drop us a mail at talent and um, yeah, maybe, maybe we could work together. If there's any questions, please, please shoot them now and um, please give me some feedback on the session. Always good to get some. Thank you. Um, hey, <laughs> I'm back, <laughs> by the way. Um, yeah, that was, I, I mean, I, I kind of joined um, midway, but that was a, a really great session. It was really based on experience, um, which, which is great. Is great. Uh, so we don't really have too much time for questions, but I'll just throw one out there, um, maybe a one minute uh, to, to evaluate on this. There's a lot of confusion sometimes between data lake versus data warehouse. Um, a lot of people confuse the two when there are actually some differences. So what do you think about that? And with your experience, with what you've been through, would probably data warehouse have been something that could be considered for your scenario? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So <clears throat> for us, in this case, the, the data lake made sense because the storage is just so much cheaper but with, yeah, with, with, with aws there's there's so many options so you could um so so that the data lake became quite slow if you wanted to query big data sets it, it's not that fast because you don't have dedicated compute um it's basically just storage but if you if you tie that with something like redshift spectrum which gives you dedicated compute and you can point it to S3 storage. That's an awesome combo, and then you get you kind of get the best best of both worlds. Yeah, um, true. And in our case, we we really muddied the water with data like data warehouse because we were doing like ETLs in our lake, um, which is not academically correct. But for the use case, it was perfect. So yeah, um, I think assess every every scenario and, and make the best decision based on your scenario. Don't don't get too academic about stuff. Yeah, true. We can't we can't put the technologies in in like specific boxes, it, it's all very adaptable based on the needs. And from what I see is, it's true, you're using the data lake both as a, a lake and a, and a warehouse. Like um, you have the analytics part, the part that goes a bit into data science, that's very good for data lake, but you also have that processed part that um, has business value. Um, so yeah, it seems like a, you, made a you made like a data lake warehouse, <laughs> which exactly. is nice. Um, so I won't hold uh, hold up too much longer. We have like a few minutes um, to close up. Uh, just a quick look at the chat. Um, ah, getting some good feedback. <laughs> the, the viewers enjoyed. And Louis Philippe awesome. wants to go to Data Lake School. But you're, you're already <laughs> at Synthesis. You can just like shift offices and like teach me, Sensei. Yeah, <laughs> I'll be here. You're welcome. Yeah, so it was a really great session. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, especially sessions based on experience, it has a lot more to offer than just, you know, uh, uh, textbook content, uh, textbook knowledge. Um, if you have any closing notes, now is the time before we say goodbye. <laughs> no, it's all good. Thank you very much. It's for all good. In. All right. Awesome. Thank awesome you. Both. See you in the next one. Bye. 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 So. Yeah. Hey, Marine. <laughs> hey, Vidush. So, what did you think of today? Yeah, yeah. so it was it was like um, a great day. I think we started a bit like um, a bit rough, getting used to the virtual conference, the new environment. Mm -hmm. But I think it went pretty well. We we um, we had a few issues. They were smoothened out, and we adapted. <laughs> so um, personally, <laughs> I also like the session as well. Uh, what about you? What did you think? It was very interesting. I can't say that I understood everything, but <laughs> it was very interesting. 
Yeah, it's more about sharing than really. It's it's not about um, understanding every single bit, but it's about sharing the different things, um, different uh, scenarios that each people encounter, each person encounters. With yeah. that, I guess it is time to wrap up new Asgard <laughs> for today. <laughs> Um, anything you want to add before we close um, off? Hey, thanks guys for having watched us all this time and we hope to see you tomorrow again. Yeah, and uh, we hope to see the chat a bit more lively tomorrow. Come on. <laughs> yeah, guys, don't be shy. It's a bit of bite. <laughs> Plus we are virtual, so like literally we, we can't bite you, so it's fine. <laughs> all right then. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I Thanks guess this is us signing off. Um, we hope to see you tomorrow and on Friday as well. And thank you for being here. Have a great evening. Thanks a lot. Bye, everyone. Bye.